brains, beauty, talent, passion. If you're here tonight, you already know that Dessa has all these qualities in spades. But working with her on this chapbook for the better part of the last year, I've discovered a lot of other traits that I think inform her practice as an artist. Kindness, humility, loyalty, a deep loyalty to her artistic comrades, a willingness to take risks, to get it wrong before she gets it just right. These are the qualities that I think make her the extraordinary artist that she is. I don't wanna to say too much about the poems in A Pound of Steam. Uh, you're gonna hear them for yourself. And as Ashley said, we'll talk a little bit more about them at the library in a few weeks. Uh, but tonight, you're gonna to, uh, experience them uh, as written art. And you're also gonna hear interpretations of them by some of Dessa's fellow musical travelers. Uh, Sims from Doomtree, uh, Jake Pavick and Ben Burwell from Indie Americana band Tajraj, and the always amazing Abby Wolf. I think you're going to love what they have done. Um, and I should mention that we've got their uh, CDs and merchandise uh, at the merch table as well as uh, Dessa's and these chapbooks. So do come on up to the, to the bar and reception and signing afterwards and uh, let's all hang out. Got a few thanks to say before bringing Dessa on up. Uh, first, as always, to our dear friends at the Walker Arts Center with whom we've been co-producing literary events for the last 13 years. Um, it is always a pleasure. Um, I wanna thank the voters of the state of Minnesota. Uh, you passed the legacy amendment and because of you, artists like Dessa and art, art organizations like Rain Taxi uh, get the support they need to try something different, try pushing the envelope, try making some art. Um, it's the will of the people, the legislature carries that out and we really thank you for it. I wanna thank artist Kai Benson for designing such a beautiful cover. I hope you have touched it, those of you who have bought it. Uh, and uh, Kelly Everding, the art director at Rain Taxi for her work on the book as well. Most of all, I wanna thank the lady herself. Uh, in my years as an editor, I have been privileged to work with some of the biggest names in writing in the country, but I can tell you honestly that this project has been one of the most uh, stimulating, surprising, uh, and, and certainly fun. I'm really proud to bring this chapbook of poetry into the world tonight and to introduce the writer behind the words. Please join me in welcoming the one and only Dessa. Well, I haven't done this before, so we're just gonna play it by ear. Thanks, Eric, for an awesome introduction. Um, it sounded sort of like we did most of our work on a pedal pub or something, it was fun. I'm gonna be serious about the work and sort of joking in between, because that's how I handle sadness. <clears throat> so the first poem that I'm gonna to read tonight is called The Letter S. And I wrote this poem after someone that I loved had a stroke. I'm gonna read a few poems, and then after having done so, I'll invite uh, one of the three musicians that Eric mentioned to perform their work in response to that poem, and then I'll hop back on up again. So that's the format in a nutshell. The letter S. By the time that I arrived, you could not say my name for the aphasia. The bleeding stopped, they told me in the hall, but you had lost the letter S. You couldn't name the shape on paper or press the sound against your teeth. They explained it as a loss of data, as if the program of you crashed and then restarted incompletely. Or, I thought privately, as if the hand of some indifferent angel held a magnet to your disc. You greeted me in a terror of apology, hysterical to demonstrate you knew me still. Although you could not find the word to designate your second son, in a panic you recited a slew of scattershot details, my birth weight, current address, 
my affinity for word games, my allergy to almonds, my life a scattered deck of cards. I tried and failed to calm you, garish with a crisp bouquet and crackling paper and a voice I'd practiced in the car, but you could not be distracted. We're only driven to fresh distress on finding yourself helpless to fashion even an apology from the words left at your disposal. The ideas were falling fast inside your head, but the parachutes would not inflate. You regarded me unblinking, palms pressed against your cheeks, and I was ushered out the door to relieve your agitation. In the hallway, sitting in a plastic chair, I had the strong, that's a drag, right? That's a, that's a shitty moment for that to happen. I'm with you, we've all had that happen. In the hallway, sitting in a plastic chair, I had the strong impression that my name itself had broken. A name that can't be spoken by the person who conferred it has plainly failed its purpose, outlasted all utility, and if I could relive our episode entirely, I'd hand the flowers to a passing nurse, march into your room with an alphabet beneath my arm, escort the doctors to the door, and dispense with all their Latin chatter. Here, I'd say, lay each shape against the bedsheet, find some combination of those 25 good letters, and find me a new name. I don't know either. Do we clap? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, this is a poem called Saya. And I think like every new author, like I'm messing with the, like let me just check in the table of contents. There's a lot of really good work here. So let me just, oh, page 13. That's a good, num strong number. Hmm. And that's fine. <clears throat> This is a poem called Saya. There are pictures out today of Saya, the new Japanese machine, a slim robot in soft plastics they've built to teach the children. The papers say that Saya has been designed with six distinct responses, happiness, sadness, surprise, fear, anger, and disgust. I begin a little tally of all the feelings I have had, but stop unsure which to count as elemental and which as only alloys. I wonder if she sees in color. Maybe it's just heat and motion that tell her where the children are and how they are behaving. I wonder if the children are free to touch her, and if they are, I wonder can she feel it. When her duties are complete, I wonder do they turn her off till morning or is she allowed to think, alone in her dark classroom, in the throes of some great seventh feeling. Let's do that. Wait, let's just go like this. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> this is the poem. Uh, I, I sent, I think there's like seven in here, and I sent five of them to Sims, Abby, and Benedict of Taj Raj. And each of the musicians selected the, the poem that they'd be responding to musically. This is the poem that Abby chose. Dear sir or madam, we changed your name while you were sleeping. You'll find your new one on the form that you'll receive at lunch. You'll be given a numbered pound of steam and a tool which may reveal its purpose to you or not, in which case it is a hand weight. Please mind it. We regret that we cannot issue another in the event that you misplace it. There will be other people seated at your table. We ask that you cultivate a fellow feeling Toward the people seated at the other tables, you may develop any attitude you like. Sensation will be almost constant. Patterns will emerge, some significant, some by sheer and simple chance. You receive the full agenda at the end of the conference, at which point you'll be asked to exit through the second door and hang your pound of steam on the hook provided. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I'm excited to welcome our first musical performer to stage, Abby and I Wolf. <laughs> Ready? Abby and I Wolf live in a tour Econo Ford line van together. We've been we've been touring the nation together for the better part of this year, and uh, I couldn't be more excited that she said yes in her willingness to interpret one of the poems.
Oh, hello. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks to everybody for coming out tonight, and thanks to Dee for having me in. Okay, this is totally new, guys. It's a new song. I've never done it before, okay? <laughs> totally new. Here we go. <clears throat> this must be my first day. Feels like I came a long way Almost be legit, I suppose But I think someone replaced my clothes And I don't recognize the sound of my own name They said, find your table and shit We'll start in just a minute Open up to chapter one You can go outside when you're done There may or may not be a quiz Just when I'm finding my way I'm stopped and detained You say I overstepped your bounds But I swear you never laid the grounds I'm learning the ropes as they break Is this a sharp collar around my neck? Sharp collar. All these rules been in place long before I showed my face. Best be careful where you walk. Invisible fence delivers a shock, and there is no way to escape. Thank you. <laughs> you did nail it. You did. I think Abby and Sims and I are the three least well-behaved people in this room. <clears throat> and that's fine. Uh, this next poem is, uh, I was delighted to find via Eric, the namesake of a cocktail, which for me is the measure of any meaningful success. <laughs> the Bullet Rosette. There are 41 types of snowflakes, all named and sketched by the physicist Ukichiro Nakaya after the death of his young wife. Head bowed in cold air labs, he spent his life at work with glass and fiber filaments, resolute to make a snowflake of his own. Last night, in an observatory just outside of Moscow, they found the first ice crystal known not to be unique. Its match fell 18 years ago, on record as one of many in an early morning storm. The same radiating spires, same lacy center, the same coquettish tumbling descent. Moscow phoned the find to London, London to New York. And so it seems that poor Nakaya, his breath forever icing up the scope, could have set aside his study and found another like her. All right, Eric, you tell me if I'm doing it wrong. I think poets like do like the, yeah. And then there's a, okay, that's nice. Okay. Uh, this is a poem called Mercy. 
And this is the poem that Sims selected to respond to. Mercy. To forgive is to summon your character, red-eyed and sober, and commanded to behave against the current of your instinct, to reach up and take down your own flag. To forgive is to break the wishbone of a living bird who consents to the procedure and volunteers to stay awake to save on anesthesia. It is to make a snow angel in the sawdust beneath the bench where they are shaving down your pride. To arrive at mercy, you pass through a tiny wooden door whose polished knob is the head of a brass pin. You do not enter whole. You, you undo yourself. Pass yourself in pieces to be assembled on the other side. Your vertebrae go singly to be rethreaded on the wire of your spine. The larger bones are first reduced by fire. It happens in the early morning hours, often in a sudden soft collapse. It happens when your lungs are, lungs are empty and your heart is still between contractions and you feel a cracking like a breaking paper dam, some pain, then swift release, and there you'll have it, every grievance unspooling at your feet, shining like cassette tape. I don't know how many have done it and survived, they don't come back to say, but I have seen them through the keyhole, swaying, mute, serene, with folded hands and upturned faces like rag dolls assembled by the blind. All right, I'm gonna welcome uh, my Doomtree cohort, Sims, to the stage. Sim I do a really good Sims impression and it goes like this. All right. It's okay. We're going to be great. <laughs> All right. When I hit the first wave, it felt kind of good. It felt kind of strange, a little test of strength. Then the second one came, and it felt kind of rushed. Felt kind of flushed, kind of felt like rage Then the third, then the fourth, then the fifth uh, Started taking water on my ship Seven, eight, nine, thirty-something Stopped counting when I And it wasn't just a sinking feeling And I didn't reach out to bring the swimming down with me I was flailing Now, I shot a couple flares on up But I was something that you dare not touch Staring at the sun Falling into darkness, wet ink smearing on the wet parchment Angels, where did you go? I've been so fucking spoiled On top of the water, like some fresh oil As much as I try To make this feel alright As much as I'd like to I can't make this feel alright you were up all night, practicing the saddest notes I went and had a smoke, had the biggest laugh Cause it ain't that bad, you just wanted to poke Wanna feel something, but you wince at the pain Shut your eyelids while I'm ripped limb by limb Leviathan, real violins, no violins All I know is I'm dying down here No 21 guns, I was 20 But self-pity ain't in my style Trail of blood or not, I'm looking at the next smile But that attracts a certain type, so it can get wild I suggest you not follow too close I never wallow, I just swallow the dose Find enough driftwood, then rebuild my boat And it ain't a pretty vessel, man, but fuck it, it floats As much as I try I can't make this feel alright As much as I'd like to, I can't make this feel all right. At first, I was so mad when it was so easy. 
for you to throw a line out And then I realize that all you do is throw lines But of a different kind So I let that anger die down But that changed it all And I'm way out here Trying so hard to care Just treading Something's pulling me down And I'm not strong enough But I can't drown now Fighting for my life And I refuse to flop or beg Had to lop the legs The waves are rolling me over The ocean just chunking me apart You couldn't see the amputee All I showed you was a soldier And that was probably the hardest part Watching my closest draw the farthest away So this is just to say I'll no longer take the company of sharks As much as I try I can't make this feel alright As much as I'd like to I can't make this feel alright All of my empathy All of my empathy All of my empathy pushed to the limit The limit All of my empathy All of my empathy All of my empathy pushed to the rigid edges Have mercy, have mercy on you I can't, I can't, I can't, can't Have mercy, have mercy on me I can't, I can't, I can't, can't Have mercy, have mercy on you I can't, I can't, I can't, can't Have mercy, have mercy on me As much as I try As much as I'd like to As much as I'd like Uh, The next poem that I'm going to read is called The Clown's New Wife. There are two kind of longer narrative poems in the collection. That's one of them. And uh, the other one, to end our trio of commissioned performances, uh, will be like an an operatic performance that includes most of the text. So I'll let let, uh, Benjamin Burwell sing that one for us instead. Yeah, look, I've already got the poet thing. I'm gonna let Benjamin Burwell sing that one. That's fun. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> it's so gross. Um, but before reading it, I do want to thank again. Um, I want to thank Eric. I'm a very headstrong. I think is an adjective that he probably didn't include. Uh, and it was only after each of our meetings that I was like, well, look who's hard to work with. <laughs> About me, because I think in, in independent hip hop, it's like. Uh, which is for those of you who are only here because you're Walker members or something. I'm also a musician and I'm in a group called Doomtree. And um, it's very good. You should check it out. But in, in indie hip hop, you're your own advocate at, at almost every turn, you know? And there's a lot of people saying, this isn't a good way to spend your time or your money or your life. And so you get really good at being like, this is awesome. I'm doing it, which is the least effective way uh, to go about receiving editorial attention. And so um, I would usually give myself pep talks like, open your heart, let down your guard in the car. But I was always late. And so I was like, open your heart, let down your guard. (laughs) So thank you, Eric, for the patience. (laughs) That's cool. Okay. Uh, This is is one of the longer poems. This is called The Clown's New Wife. (laughs) The Clown's New Wife is Younger perhaps by as much as 15 years. Time hasn't touched her hair so black and heavy and immodest that the most religious of us turn away when she unties it. But our last long winter washed the color from her face. Now she cannot be induced to blush for shame or love or fever. Now the redness of her mouth seems strange, a bruise, a cause for some concern. That spring, she married the clown. Our winters have been mild since. 
Their engagement was too brief to meet any standard of decorum. Still, the announcement was a welcome one. The burden to morale is woeful in a township with a widowed clown. In the years he'd been alone, his two young girls descended into disarray. Their hair was fixed in ribboned knots, their clothing mended with big stitches. They wore their dress shoes all week long, the bottoms smooth enough to skate on. Mercifully, their dispositions were undamaged. They reported to school each morning holding hands, chattering in some invented language. But every day they more resembled a pair of rag dolls locked beneath their arms. On Sundays when the clown arrived at morning mass, the women cooed too loudly over his blonde girls. The men shook his hand as if pumping water from a well. Every week a stage show, the entire cast overacting their small parts. Work was scarce then for the clown. And when he had it, the audiences laughed before he could deliver on the comic line or complete a practiced fumble. He was well aware of the pity he provoked. So when the clown's new wife first expressed her interest, his imagination strained to picture them together, sitting down to supper or lying down to bed. She wore her hair in a foreign fashion, swept flat across her cheek like a crow's wing folded neatly over her right eye. I didn't have that haircut then, and that's just mortifying. <laughs> cool. <laughs> cool. She smoked sweetened cigarettes in slim, dark dresses, and the clown had heard the stories that she entertained late parties where she disallowed her varied guests from ever setting down their glasses. And as a model for the rule, she would drink all evening from an upturned pewter bill. But the winter she went pale made her slenderness begin to look severe. Her imported dresses seemed a relic of a costume party in the light of next, the next day. She invited fewer visitors from far away, deigned to attend the local ladies' luncheons. And by the thaws of March, she was seen walking in the evenings, escorted by the clown. Theirs was the sort of unlikely alliance that develops from unforgiving circumstance. It was as though they met each other underwater, on two dives for the same coin, their hands connecting as they felt along the bottom. There was little time, an implied parody of purpose, and a chorus shouting from the shore. They nodded their vows, then kicked upward towards the surface to gasp and sputter their hellos. Almost three, three years now they lived together. She has coaxed the children to try curry and cayenne. They have coaxed her into heelless shoes. The, the clown's career has lifted like a kite. He assures her they could now afford to, but she prefers not to entertain. Every second Friday, they dine out with the blacksmith and his wife, a smart and pretty teacher, who the clown at first imagined might engage the table in the high and stylish conversation, the sort his wife might sometimes miss, but more than not, the talk was of their children. Languid in her chair, his wife nodded often, smiling frequently enough, and the clown would order one more bottle of the perfumey wine he asked they carry just for her. The clown had worried that the blacksmith, a broad man respected for his skill and strength, but not for feats of etiquette, might offend or disappoint his wife. But in life, his wife was more forgiving and the blacksmith more polite than their figurines behaved in his imagination. Her only reservation seemed to be revealed when the blacksmith passed a plate or served her. Her eyes then rested too long on his heavy fingers, perpetually blackened by the forge. The clown presumed that in her lingering appraisal, the blacksmith may have failed some small examination, but she gave no indication that she was less than satisfied with the company they kept. This summer's carnival has just begun. High season for the clown, who performs twice every afternoon. His wife visits most days to join the circle gathered around him, his daughters walk on either side, trailing half a step behind her. The elder girl wears her pleated dress and a belt, her fine blonde bangs fixed with sugar water to sweep low, concealing one blue eye. The girls push to the inner ring to enjoy the celebrity of their association. His wife keeps to the second row to watch her clown at work. He's first a juggler who can't keep the balls in play, then a clumsy conjurer whose tricks are all revealed, and now a stumbling drunkard whose accidental rhyming delights the young as nonsense and the adults as quite obscene. 
The crowd applause, gladly parted with their coins, but cocooned in all the cheering, the clown's new wife contracts inside her dress. As he ends his spectacle, cap falling to the dust with every pitching bow, she cannot trace a sharp partition between clown and man, both flushed beneath a streaking mask of bone white paint. Amid the dispersing crowd, the pretty teacher waves goodbye, her smallest son on hip exhausted. The clown's new wife feels her own hand lifting as if by pulley to return the gesture. The blacksmith, as they turn to leave, takes the drowsing child into his arms, the boy becoming weightless in his blackened hands. A tugging at her elbow affixes her attention to the clown's youngest daughter, who is eager now to leave. On the short walk home, which seems longer to the little girl from whom it asks more steps, the clown holds one of her small hands, his slender wife the other. Dinner is served and eaten quickly, and bedtime is observed without complaint. Long hours in the sun have tanned and tired both the girls. In the quiet of their bedroom, the clown removes the last of his vestments and hangs them with great care. They stand as a third party in the room, a ghostly clown, watching as the man climbs into bed and his wife, pale as china, unties her heavy hair, undamming a river of ink. She steps out for a long last cigarette but he is still awake when she returns. He makes love to her so tenderly that she cannot help but think less of him. And then, oblivious to her unease, he turns and falls into a heaving sleep and another aching dream of his first wife. Thanks. Uh, for the last commissioned performance, we'll be hearing uh, from two members of Taj Raj. Benjamin Burwell on vocals and Jake Pavic on piano. And I, haven't heard, I hadn't heard any of these performances before this evening, so I'm really excited for this one. Um, this will be performed, as I understand it, in a classical style with Benjamin Burwell singing operatic tenor. Fantastic. Without further ado. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jeffrey, 
tall and thin, sharp and stylish, in a meticulous, ridiculous, exaggerated type of way. When Jeffrey and I'd stay at Daphne's house, we'd take the windows out, sit on the chimney's edge. We'd talk, swing, and kick our legs, sometimes catching just by the ankle to hang slack and walk to looks seem pulled from the pages of a catalogue, skate shoes, dress slacks, and meticulously tousled hair. his little elf quite seriously, not a popular position in our circle. We'd exchange sharp jokes at the expense of our small world, flat-chested and insatiable. <laughs> but he defended Daphne, once out on the roof while the rest of us were parading old complaints. He slung his arm around my shoulder and recalled an episode from her recent doctor's visit. She was receiving vaccinations, and the prep nurse soothed her with a tired, small, false promise. You won't feel a thing. Jeffrey, drunk on just a little high expansive and overwhelmed in his own sensitivities, interrogating no one in particular. Can you imagine? So often the very best that can be said of them is, honey, if you're lucky, Decline, light irritated Jeffrey. He donned a cap and pulled it low, wore sunglasses while indoors, went hoarse, then gray, then difficult to see it all. Molly still lives amongst the trappings of her infancy. I still got time. I think more than I would like. Whereas Daphne was the first to everything, curse words, concerts, and boys. Ten and three quarters. She was ten and three quarters when she let him go. I spent the first year hating her for turning him to steam. But in my finer moments, when Generosity exceeds my loneliness. I hold my knees against my chest and give thanks to whatever corner of Daphne's little mind or heart thought to make a man so strange and lovely.
very last time out on the chimney's edge tinsel lines of rain fell through his foggy frame soaked my shirt front to my skin I closed my eyes felt him lean in I waited for his hand to lift my chin but at I didn't If you are thinking about publishing your own chapbook, but are wondering what it might be like to commission three of your friends to write original work to accompany it, um, you should take some acid. This is crazy. <laughs> this is crazy. Oh, I'm totally, totally overwhelmed. Um, thanks to Abby Wolf. Act like a rap show for a second. Thanks to Abby Wolf. You. Yeah. Seals of Doomtree. And Benjamin and Jake of Taj Raj. Okay, uh, we are, I think, now at the point of our program where we're going to take some questions if there are any from the crowd. So we've got, oh, flight stewardess moment. We've got two before assisting other, no, we've got two. Uh, two capable microphone technicians who are kind of coming down the aisle here in lanyards and assured steps. So if you have any questions for me or Eric or any member of the performing cast today, feel free. I know we've got one there. I have a question for everybody and anybody about the incubation period of your creations and just where you were when the melody came to you or when the words came to you and what you were doing or what you wrote it on or anything mm. interesting like that. I'm reluctant to step off stage, which I'd usually do to just like pass this around because I know it's being webcast from somewhere. D do you mind stepping up for a second to answer? Abby? Um, hey, uh, yeah, let's see. We just got back from a two week tour on Sunday night. So I think when I started writing my beat, I was in the tour van with a laptop, uh, which then had to be started over again, uh, a week later, <laughs> with another laptop, still in the van. Um, uh, but I read the, so anyway, I read the, um, I read the poem quite a while ago, and I loved it, and I thought, I thought it was like, um, and mine again was Dear Sir and Madam, um, which was the maybe third, second or third one that you read, and I thought it was just so um, to the point and succinct that there was nothing left to be said at all about the theme, and I was like, wait a second, I, I have nothing to do. What am I going to do? How do I s respond? There's, it's like, it's a perfect little pearl. Um, so, so for a while, I, right, great, cool, awesome. <laughs> so I thought for a while, and, uh, and uh, I was telling Tedessa backstage that um, I was suddenly reminded of a memory of being at the end of first, or kindergarten or first grade at the school end picnic. Um, eating lunch, like eating like hot dogs and chips in the park in my small, small, small town in, in rural Illinois. And, uh, and suddenly finding myself having, having broken a rule that I had no idea was in place. Um, and this feeling of like anger and confusion about like, well, how am I supposed to be responsible for all of these rules that have come before me that I haven't been educated about yet? So um, that, was the, that was the inspiration for my tune. Are you, are you game sims to come up? Uh -oh. <laughs> I can feel you wanting to come up. <laughs> I think we all can. Is it, is it laying more? <laughs> I think I was laying as flat as I could possible to, to pretend like I was sleeping. <laughs> ah, no, I wasn't actually. What? what was the question again? How did I incubate it? Um, 
Man, uh, it was hard. I wrote two different songs. I wrote one for Saya as well, and uh, it wasn't as cool. Um, and it was really frustrating because it wasn't very cool. And I was really hoping it was going to be cool because I was like, kind of like creatively in a rut. And I was like, this is going to be perfect. Someone's going to start me off with a concept and go. Like, um, uh, there's probably minimal amount of rappers in this room right now. But sometimes when you're freestyle rapping, someone's like, you run out of stuff to like talk about right off the top of your head. So just people will throw words or ideas at you, and then you kind of keep going. And so this was like the idea with writing a song is that you need like some kind of launch pad or whatever. And so I was like, this is going to be perfect. I'm going to have these, you know, two Dessa poems. I'm going to write two songs to them. Two songs, like, further in my new album. You know what I mean? Like, just, yeah, pfft, no problem. And I just, like, toiled on it. So I wrote it on everything I could. Like, I have notes in my cell phone. I have um, something I just recently discovered is when you put your phone into your laptop and it goes into your iTunes, all of the cr uh, crazy mumblings that you did into your voice recorder are saved <laughs> and backed up now into your laptop and labeled Andrew Sims. <laughs> As the artist, just dozens of these, like, I'm like, <laughs> uh, rap. <laughs> just ridiculous. So that's, that's my process. <laughs> it's had a lot of recording and getting over yourself is pretty much the deal. Huh? I loved it. Ben? <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, well, we didn't actually write any of the words to, to that piece. <laughs> Unlike both those two, we just kind of took, yeah, we did, I trimmed a whole hell of a lot, so, <laughs> that's, I picked it because it's one of my favorite things I've read recently, and that's, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, it was like, I think you, we, we would still be singing right now, and the Q&A would be starting in like three or four minutes, so, we, in order for brevity, sake of brevity, we, we, we decided to do it that way. We basically sat down, um, you know, in our studio. Pavic said, who are you a fan of? Uh, who are your big piano guys? Nils from, Nils from uh, Philip Glass kind of stuff. Yeah. And so we just basically kind of used those models. And we could, did anybody get a quote? We did a quote, like a classical quote of a song. Yeah. Stephen Foster. I don't know. There's a, nothing, nothing but a plain old soldier, an old revolutionary soul. Yeah, that one. Of course. She. Anyways. I, yeah, I don't know. That's basically how we did that one. And big props to Jake for bringing in that piano, and he like built it today and tuned it up just for the performance. So. I think we might have time for one or two more. Should there be one or two more? Yeah. This side of the room is winning. I see two hands right here. One on your left and one on your right. Right in pink, left in a sensible three-quarter shirt. Hello. Yeah. Um, Dessa, this question is for you. There really seems to be a musical tone to your, mm. your written words. I mean, there's a beat. It really flows. Is that intentional, or does that just kind of happen because of your other life as a musician? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, because of the drums in my head that I can't turn off. Um, I guess the honest answer is I think a lot of, you know, good poet, we were talking backstage, like, what is poetry? What is good poetry? What is bad poetry? Um, I don't know that I, I feel like most poets, and I'm sure many more than me, are like aware of this and pay attention to the spoken quality of the work that they're doing. I think in some part, it may be that if I were to, hey, Doug. Okay, great. So Doug is um is doing sound today. And yeah. Hey Doug. You thought I was kidding when I did this. When I said I was gonna do this. You ready? Doesn't matter. Okay. I'm gonna read a line and then you read a line. Okay, so let's say. The bleeding stopped, they told me in the hall, but you had lost the letter S. Okay, so in my opinion, Doug has like one of the best fucking voices for radio I've ever heard, including on the radio. The bleeding stopped, they told me in the hall, but you had lost the letter S. So, I'm sorry. I don't have your book. I know. Just remember oh, these words. Ready? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you wanted me to do the next line. Oh, yeah. No, that would be horrible. I don't have, I don't I'd be the worst. I'd be the worst poet ever. I'd never be asked back. 
The bleeding stopped, they told me in the hall, but you had lost the letter S. The bleeding stopped, they had told me in the hall, but you had lost the letter S. Gary Acton, watch out. That's messed up. The only reason I asked Doug to, you know, to indulge me was because I feel like maybe if I gave it to somebody else, I don't know. That's the only way I read things aloud. So maybe if I had another poet handle the book, they'd find a really innovative way to read it that wasn't quite so 4-4. You know what I mean? If you feel like there's a regular pulse, maybe in large part because it's, um, that's the only way I know how to present things aloud. But I'm going to pretend that that was a compliment. I'd be like, damn, why are you so good at doing stuff with a pulse? Instead of like, why can't you do anything but do stuff with a pulse? <laughs> So mine's kind of along the same lines. I'm just wondering how you decide what thoughts to put in poetry and which ones to do into song lyrics. Yeah. Um, so I feel like there's, when I get an idea, there's like three general places that it could fall. One is in a poem, one is in a song, and then one is in an essay. Uh, I think that I'll end up making my rent from music mostly, but I still feel like I'm, I'm strongest as an essayist. That's where I feel most confident anyway. Um, but of course, you don't, you know, essays don't really sell out for stuff. So, <laughs> did you get the subtext? <laughs> no. Um, so I feel like a, a, a lot of times if there's kind of a, you know, a little, an idea hurtling towards me, the first thing I'll try to do is class it by determining its scope. So if this is um, a long piece that has a lot of kind of sub-themes, a lot of subtext and a lot of potential uh, digressions and counter arguments, then it's probably best served as an essay uh, because also it would be like a 94 minute song. Um, and if it is something that I'm reluctant to quantize, meaning if I really have an idea that I like, an image, an image that I really like, um, and I don't want to make any compromises on meter, which sometimes I have to do in rap music, you know, because you got to make sure that stuff stays interesting for three minutes, you know, to hear you gotta make sure that the patterns vary between the verse and the hook and the bridge if you've got one. If I don't feel like making any compromises, I feel like, no, this is the perfect distillation of language. Um, th then I'll try to incorporate it into a poem. That was my, I know that I'm not very awesome at being mindful of time and this is a venue that is much more mindful than I am. Can I make a discreet gesture to you that goes like this? I'm good. Is there one more question that might, yeah, I see. Um, in the, it's, anybody, it's anybody's question. It's right in the middle of the, the second and last rows. Um, so I follow a lot of your work and you have kites as a reoccurring theme yeah. that I notice. Yeah. And I want like, backstory yeah what it means i think I, it's like that first of all thanks for listening to a lot of stuff the question was kites seem to show up in a lot of your stuff how come i think i've developed a good answer for that like when i'm doing interviews but the honest truth is i'm not sure it might be on some freudian shit that my dad was um my dad was a glider pilot and gliders are like planes without motors um but i'm also sort of just attracted to the engineering elegance of a paper machine that defied gravity that we put in the hands of children. That just seems amazing. That's like a, you know, I feel like it's a self-writing song, sort of. It's just insane, dude. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I was hoping that you could just speak a little bit about like collaboration and your collaborative process when you write something, like who you bounce it off of, go back to the drawing board, rewrite, and kind of how did you get those I, I like to write I don't know other people that are really poets and you, so I don't, I don't you like to write personally I do okay and I don't have people to bounce it off of so I was curious kind of how you how you built that yeah. circle of people I found that um I am I participate in workshopping but I'm very selective about it so I used to very briefly briefly I used to teach classes on how to write uh promotional stuff like bios and I used to read teach a couple classes on how to write lyrics and it felt like workshops were only as good as the people who are participating in them. So I'm, I look for writers who are really good, like all the way good who will still give me the time of day. You know what I mean? Like, I, have I written Billy Collins? Absolutely. Has he ever written back? Absolutely not. <laughs> you know? Um, so for me, I think some of those people are writers and writerly. 
some of those people are also just um, good friends who who I know are going to give it to me straight. And t to me, anyway, the best question isn't what should I change. Um, and it took me t almost ten years, I think, to figure that out. The best question is w which parts of this confuse you, and you'll be surprised. Like, oh, the whole time I thought she was the mom. You're like, well, shit. That's not tight. That ruins the whole thing. So if you just say, what do you think this is about and which parts confuse you, then I think you're, you are you got to be at the helm of the ship. You know, I don't, th I, I, I don't believe that great poems are written by committee. Um, but I, I do think that that feedback is important. So I would just say, yeah, I mean, kind of working your way up. I also did some creative writing classes in college. So I, I maintain contact with the two best, in my opinion, the two best writers in that class. One of them is Brian Bieber, who released his own book, Recently, and the other is Alexa Stevens, uh, who appears sometimes, I think, on, on the NPR station here. So, thanks for asking. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Um, did, in your taking of the name Dessa, did that change your personal voice at all? Um, so I was born Maggie Wander. And I love you, mom, I can see you. But I never, I never, even when I was little, I would pretend I had a different name. Um, Maggie's an awesome name. It just didn't feel like mine. So um, even when I was, you know, in elementary school, I would try to get people to call me something else. And it finally stuck when I was in my late teens. And I was singing at a karaoke bar illegally. And I thought it would be a really great place to have a fake name so I didn't get in trouble. Yeah. So I... I went by Dessa ever ever since that. Did it change my voice? I think I was too young to like have another, you know what I mean? I, I hadn't developed any other voice yet by then, so. This is the last one. Oh, what an honor. Um, so this makes a lot of sense in my head. Hopefully it makes sense out of my mouth. That's totally <laughs> what's going on today, yeah. Wonderful, well help me out if not and just pretend. But I'd like to hear you speak on, um, we're talking about creative process a lot, but it's kind of obvious to say that um, so much emotion comes from within in your experiences, but also I'd like to hear your thoughts on just going beyond that and going like mm. completely fictional and how do you get there and how much of that do you do? Um, I would say that I'm most confident in my work like doing creative nonfiction meaning, which I think is a very sexy genre that has a really, a, I don't know, if there were a branding consultant, that would be the genre that could use one. I think creative nonfiction sounds super lame and very academic. But in reality, it's like, I don't know, it's like the the person in your friend group who is the best at telling true stories at a bar, you know, even when you all know the story, but they've got the timing right, and they've got that way of like doing the eyebrow thing, and um, and they can tell it rapidly when it calls for a, a rapid, well, you know what I'm saying. It's that, you know, it's telling of the true stories that of lived experience in a way that f makes it feel uh, like art. So the people who do that well, in my opinion, a lot of them are named David. Uh, it's David Sedaris, David Foster Wallace, David Rakoff, and thank you, Dave Eggers. Um, so, <laughs> Sims is set. We sit next to each other doing a lot of interviews in the van. <laughs> so I could tell Sims is too. Um, I would say that I feel most confident doing true stuff and I feel less confident being totally fictive. So I feel like I'm a better photographer than a painter. You know, with a photographer you're asked to say, tell me when you see something cool. Tell me when you see something cool. And as a, a painter it's like, make something cool. Uh, that feels terrifying. So I think for even even the stuff that that feels most fictional is usually me not wanting to write from the first person feminine perspective, and writing from the dudes like I don't know a lot of songs who have like male narrators is how I imagine it would be to date me, <laughs> you know, which can suck sometimes. I know, um, yeah. So I think that there is a lot of craft between me and a plain story, but there is relatively little fiction between me and and the page, yeah. Okay, uh, Ben, are you game still? You have to be, because I just said that. <laughs> Sorry. Demarie, do you want me? You in? Yes, okay. Uh, we're gonna try to do a song. <clears throat> this is a song from my most recent record called Dear Marie, and Benjamin Burwell is gonna play acoustic guitar, and Abby Wolf is gonna 
sing and let's just fill it, fill it out. I'm going to back up so I can see Abby. <coughs> and that is tour bronchitis. It takes around two weeks to go away. Cool. <clears throat> Should we get closer? Cool. Cool. That's cool. All right. of your time for this apology oh dear Marie you were right about me dear Marie you were right you were right you said that I could leave you lonely in a crowd smiling bright for Everyone but yeah. you yeah. 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 And I'm embarrassed to confess it But it all yeah. rings true yeah. You said that charm of mine was easy to do So if I'm so smart, how can I learn so slow? You had the hard part, I was the last to know I let the flesh blind me Years pass by Standing in your life For most of the time I did it, I kissed him I knew it would hurt you But I put down my loneliness And that felt like virtue enough I know it's much too late No need to reply I put us all I'm lousy at that. Whoa. Doesn't have to be that. Do it slow. Yeah, we'll do oh. it. Oh. 
Last night, old friend, big wedding, and I knew you'd be there too. Look at us, all grown up, collared shirts and high heeled shoes. You cross the room, just the decent thing to do. Make sure we'd all been introduced. You brought your new friend, I brought mine. Shake hands, pay courtesy, it's due. But it takes its toll, and it takes it all. We lived in too long, too close. So call. You're asking, can't we just be friends? But this bell in my chest still rings And it's better to just pretend I can't see you waving Can't hear you call my name it. And I know how much you hate it Babe, I gotta walk away You once said if we were careful We could do this all our lives Oh, but one of us got clumsy, and both of us got wise, and now we're not so young, so I wish it well, and we've been living too long, too close, and I'm ready to let you go. I think she lives around here I see her almost daily All I can do to stop myself from saying something crazy I don't think badly of her I hope she makes you happy It's just a lot to ask to watch your future walking past me And I know that jealousy's a perfect waste of time But left to my devices I've spent far too long wasting my love. I've spent far too long wasting my love. And we've been living too long, too close, and I'm ready to let you go. you go I'm ready call of your goals thanks thanks Ben thanks Abby Sims and Jake and Eric uh we're going to go have some cocktails in the Cargill spot, so you should come and say hello. Thanks again. <laughs>